um, then we also have a, a host or hostess uh, called Dr. Mingfei Ma. Is Mingfei here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Everyone. Yeah. Well, as a host, you may um, now uh, talk to um, the, um, uh, the the three distinguished speakers uh, on the panel. So uh, I'll let you do it because I think the more or less the people who have stayed here are the same people as before who have actually been to the applied urban modeling. Um, Serious, so I don't actually have to say a lot. I think you probably could uh, st start straight away uh, in this case. Okay, uh, is Marcel online now? Uh, Marcel is online, but uh, I think Marcel probably needs um, a, a a brief um, uh, ref uh, kind of a refreshing um, because uh, he's been really working very hard uh, chairing the session before and also deeply involved in the discussion of this session. Okay, so and the, the, meanwhile, do you know uh, everybody, um, the, the speakers of um, uh, this session? Shall I introduce you? Uh, yeah, well, of course, I know David Simmons, who is my boss. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I think yeah. I met Corinne and uh, David Mass in diff um, different. Uh, meetings and conferences. The, the different sessions uh, in the applied urban modeling series. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. So um, hello everyone. I'm Ming Fei. I'm I did my PhD in the modeling center several years ago, and now I'm a senior consultant in David Simmons Consultancy. So shall we just move to this session now, Ying? Yeah, move to the session. I think this is the right time, and the Marcel will come to join you, but. Uh, uh, be brave and then you do the introduction this time. Okay, so uh, because I see some new audience here, so I would like to do a very short... Hi, Marcel. <laughs> Hi, so I would like... Marcel, to... you're muted. Um, so are you, are you saying something? Uh... Fine, yeah. thank you, Mick Fei. Hi, so I just said I would just um, have a brief introduction and then I'll move to this session. So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, maybe good morning for people in different parts of the world. I'm Dr. Mingfei Ma, I'm one of the convener of the Cambridge Applied Urban Modeling Symposium. So on behalf of the scientific committee and my fellow conveners of AUM, I'd like to welcome you all and to this online global workshop session. And then this session is titled uh, New, uh, New Modeling Frontiers. So the idea of this uh, online workshop is to invite our colleagues who are dedicated to developing new urban analysis and modeling from all time zones of the world. Of course, we expect colleagues from the local time zone to join the seminar now, and also from the neighboring time zones. But of course, you are welcome to join all the sessions. But of course, please be aware of the time difference. Our online workshop is being recorded, so colleagues can watch the preceding videos after the whole workshop. And we're going to upload it online in the AUM webpage. So there are three quick points. Um, regarding the timing of this session. First of all, uh, this workshop now is running on Zoom meeting mode. That means everyone can communicate directly with any other, uh, with the whole panel and audience. And secondly, if you would like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand and then you will be unmuted and uh, will be invited to ask a question live, or you may use the chat box and thirdly, each session started around five minutes past, uh, uh, past the hour and then will be finished five minutes before the end of the second hour so that we'll have some time for changeover to the next session. And now is the time for me to introduce our discussant, Professor, uh, Professor Marcel Eichenick. 
So Marcel is a emeritus professor of land use and transport studies in the Martin Center and our formal, the former head of the department. And he's also a research fellow in Churchill College in the University of Cambridge. And he's an international expert in urban and regional planning and has been involved in the development of many cities across the world. So Marcel, I will hand over to you to introduce the speakers and the chair of the session. Thank you, Mikfei. Uh, Mikfei, um, very nice to see you uh, and everybody around that. So um, here we have three presentations by different uh, speakers, and starting with Professor Corinne Malley, who is a professor, professor emerita of the Institute of Transport of the University of Sydney. And she's a transport economist and specializing in public transport. And it is very interesting, her talk, which is, I have never seen that kind of talk in, in the applied urban modeling, but as you can see, we are very diverse here, and we have a very interesting uh, discussion about travel behavior, and particularly traveling with dogs in public transport, which is uh, um, very interesting and depending very much on the national culture, according to her. So uh, uh, Professor Corinne will talk about that. Then is Dr. David Simon. He's director of his uh, namesake uh, consultancy. And has, um, he's a planner uh, with specializing in modeling and with a PhD uh, in uh, modeling at, uh, from Cambridge uh, University, and has a very wide experience of uh, applied urban modeling and developing his own models um, around the world. Um, he will be uh, talking about, uh, I think, with Valentina Naka, which is also a co-author of this presentation, who is um, a, a a planner who is uh, um, with uh, a consultancy um, consultant for the um, Davis Simon uh, consultancy, and is an like, expert in modeling. And it's a very interesting uh, talk about you know the implication of modeling in this pandemic and post-pandemic behavior. So we we'll look very much forward to an interesting presentation. And finally, Dr. Um, David Metz, who is a, an honorary professor in the Center for Transport Studies of University College London, and he was a former uh, chief scientist at the Department of Transport of the UK. And he is a um, biochemist by training and physics, physicist, uh, with a PhD from King's College London. And um, we look very much forward uh, to his presentation of, uh, about model failures of forecasting the, the expansion, the impact of the expansion of the M25, which is an orbital road around London. So starting with uh, Professor Corinne Malley, could you uh, uh, comment, please? Thank you. Hi, my name's Corin Mully. I'm going to share my screen and then turn the picture off, if that's okay, because our um, broadband has a tendency to be um, difficult. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, a wonderful picture of the dog, actually. Yeah. But. So can I start by saying thank you for coming to this presentation. And the first thing that I think you'll notice is the title is a little bit different from what you've been promised. But it is a title that's closer to what I propose to talk about, which is a couple of papers that we've already published and the way that they fit together. So this is a good point to acknowledge my co-authors on a number of different papers. Um, Jennifer Kent from the University of Sydney is a co-author on all the papers and Nick Stevens and Laura Goll are co-authors on this particular one that I'm going to talk about. As with many transport topics, 
one's co-authors often have a different approach to the subject that you're looking at. And Jen and I come to this topic from different but related directions. Jen's a planner who's concerned with how to lower car dependence and develop more sustainable policies and practices. But my perspective is perhaps a little bit different and it's to see how public transport policy is developed and how we as academics can act as disruptors to this policy making process and push it in a more sustainable direction. The empirical work which underpins the work that we've done in this area is based on the greater Sydney metropolitan area in Australia. This is a particularly car centric city, as I'm sure anyone who knows Sydney will confirm. And all sorts of things surprised me about Sydney and its car centricness when I first moved there. For example, what other capital city have you come across where there's a shopping centre with free parking within 200 metres of the central station? I just found it mind boggling. Um, sorry, I haven't been moving this on. So the context is Sydney. In terms of the public transport, only guide dogs are allowed on public transport. There are minor exceptions in the center of the city for ferries and light rail, um, unless you take your animal in a carrier. But I would like to see people carry a German shepherd in a carrier onto a train or onto a bus. So pets aren't welcome. And yes, I know I am a dog person. These are our dogs that are in the bottom of the picture. But this is intended as a serious study of, of how you need public transport policy to embrace not only those easy journeys, like the journeys to work, but other trips that are made by people with perhaps frail relatives, trips with children, trips to pick up bulky goods from the shop, all these sorts of trips, which may be a small proportion of the overall trips, but are important to the user and need public transport to be flexible, both temporally and spatially. And if we ignore these messy trips, then what we're doing in cities like Sydney and in other areas, other cities where they are very car dependent is reinforcing that car dependence. So I would argue that our contribution here is wider than just simply dogs on buses. So far, we've written four related bits of work on this. The first <clears throat> was one that was very much of an ad hoc survey, but identified that there was really quite a lot of car dependent journeys with dogs. The second one picked this up and explored in a separate survey what it was that respondents thought about a hypothetical change if the policy was to allow dogs on public transport in Sydney. And what this second paper showed, this one here, showed that actually the issue was more about whether or not you liked dogs or you didn't like dogs, rather than the transport issue per se. And this means that you really need to, as a policymaker, look beyond the transport issue if you're going to make sound public transport policy. But this second paper, in a sense, led directly to the third one, which is the one I want to talk about here. And this looks at how policy itself might be affected or influenced by cultural norms, and then in turn, how to use this in developing new policy for public transport. So I want to talk a little bit about the first two papers before moving on to this one. So this is the first paper which looked at a sample of just over or just under 1300 people and established for us that owning a dog really did create trips. These are the headline figures that, you know, out of the nearly 10,000 dog related trips, nearly half of them started in a private car. 
And if you work out the number of dog related trips by car per week, and then multiply it by the number of households in Sydney, which have one or more dogs, you're left with a potential of something like 2.4 million dog related private car trips each week. And that paper with this um, bulking up of numbers caused a bit of a rumpus in Sydney, particularly with the policymakers who were really very embarrassed about how they couldn't really explain how this policy had come about and indeed why it should be in place. Turning to the second paper, the starting point for this was the demand for messy trips, which I've already talked about, which we felt that should be met by public transport and that dog trips are really just one example of this. So as I've said already, we did a survey about a hypothetical change in policy using a panel. And what we found was that the policy support was related to attitudes to dogs, in particular as to whether the respondents were in a sense pro-dog rather than to the transport issue which was under consideration. And I perhaps ought to say here that the pro-dog respondents weren't necessarily people that owned dogs themselves, although it did include dog owners, but the attitude towards the potential policy change really did split along the lines of whether or not they like dogs. And that brought us to this study that I want to talk about, which is what examining the policy about dogs can tell us about public transport policy. And I perhaps should be clear that from this picture, we're not advocating a dogs on public transport policy to the exclusion of passengers, but to actually see how messy journeys can be accommodated by public transport. Because if you bulk up the messy journeys that are made by all sorts of people, we're looking at a very real contribution to public transport demand. So this third study is based on research that we carried out to the beginning of last year. It looks at um, about the policies of about 130 different cities around Europe, Australia and North America. And in total, it covers 24 different countries. So we've got capital and other cities in the um, data set, so to speak. And the analysis is based on um, developing the crosstab analysis that suggested that there was some sort of relationship or association between culture and the nature of the policies. So starting with the collection of policies that we looked at, we found that many cities information was available on the net and that was done in conjunction with information we took from a blog of someone who traveled the world with their dog and cross-checked that information with the particular cities. Two aspects of the public transport policies appeared to us to be important when we were looking at the question of norms. First of all, how friendly the policy was in general. And we set three sort of different levels of dog friendliness, whether or not dogs were allowed at all. So that would be where Sydney comes in, where dogs were restricted to a container. And a third level, which is the friendliest one, which was either gave few or no, no restrictions. And you can see here, coming down here, that the most of the restrictions where they existed was to charge a fare for a dog. There were some locational restrictions, some time restrictions, and some restrictions based on the type of dog. And then, <clears throat> We tried to think about what this meant in terms of national culture. And I guess as a transport economist, I found the concept of national culture quite difficult. So the definition that we're working from is one that 
Hofstede gives, which is the collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the member of one national group from another. And I think us as Europeans, even though the UK is now outside Europe, we would recognize the way that moving across national borders in Europe does bring you into contact with different national cultures, which are expressed in different ways. So <clears throat> the two most commonly used indices of national culture are those that are developed by Hofstede and by someone who's called Inglehart. This paper uses the Hofstede framework because it's more multidimensional than the Inglehart scales, whereas the Inglehart scales are more usually used to track changes over time. Now, the Hofstede dimensions, which I'm going to be talking about, are based on an ongoing survey of value systems in about 100 countries. They were first started in 1967, and they've been tracking different attitudes and responses to statements over time. The framework's bound, based on a factor analysis to reduce the statements into a number of dimensions, which I'm going to show on the next slide. There are basically six different national culture dimensions, and anyone that's particularly interested can look at the Hofstede um, website, and this goes into it in more detail. As I said already, as a transport economist, I find these um, sort of social sides of, of dimensions quite difficult to understand. And I suppose my first thought was, how on earth can things like power distance have an impact on the development of public transport policy? But I was rather convinced by the um, analysis that we did, simple though it was. So these six um, dimensions look at different aspects of the way in which national cultures could be different from each other. And in terms of the data that we looked at out of the 24 different countries, the next slides give you some ideas of, of how they might vary between countries. So this one is the power distance and there's only a selection of countries here. And this is where um, citizens um, except that there are inequalities in the distribution of power. And you can see there's quite a lot of variation between countries. I mean, Denmark is quite low here. Spain and France are quite high. In itself, I don't think it tells you very much, but in combination with the other dimensions, you start to build up a picture. So the next one in terms of individualism, which is the extent to which individuals are prepared to sub subvert their own desires in order to give you the well being of the collective. Again, you can see there's actually less variation here, but Denmark is high here rather than low as it was in the previous slide. Spain is not um, as high as some of the others, but it's um, higher than it was. And it doesn't always apply that you're high in one and low in another, because if we look at France here, which is reasonably high, and we look at France in the previous one, you will see that France is also high. So there's no specific pattern that one might expect. I'm going to just look through um, the dimensions to give you a feeling for the variation, because I want to make sure that we finish on time. And you can see, actually, Denmark is fairly low on a number of these, but very high on indulgence. And in terms of the analysis, what we did was we looked at some correlations. So the analysis is quite simple, looking at the connection between or the association between the pet friendliness score and the Hofstede dimensions. And you can see. I thought this was quite surprising, that actually all of them, apart from this one here, 
had a significant association with the with the dog friendliness scores. So what can this tell us about the association and development of policies specifically in relation to dogs, but as an example of a, a messy trip that isn't currently easily provided by public transport. And what we found by looking at the five significant dimensions was that countries that were currently welcoming dogs on public transport were associated with higher power distance scores, higher uncertainty avoidance scores, higher long-term orientation scores, but lower individualism scores and lower indulgence scores. In sense, what we're saying is those countries which allow dogs on their public transport does appear to be related to national cultures and related to those natural cultures which are more conservative, which have a long-term orientation and an acceptance of hierarchies. I'm going to conclude here and um, happy to answer questions and discuss it as people wish. I'd like to start by saying that while dogs on public transport is the example that's used here, there are, as I've already said, a myriad of other seemingly inconsequential trips that make up modern life for people. And these need to be accommodated by public transport services if we're going to get public transport to be the main mainstream mode for travel, which of course in turn has a sustainability implication. I've already talked about how modern life is mess messy, but again, I'd like to reinforce the fact that we need to find some way of incorporating these messy trips into public transport delivery. And I think you can see that whilst the example here is about dogs, there are many trips which are not dog related, which come into the same category. And recognizing that cultural norms may play a part in policy determination means I think that we need, we've got another route for policymakers to take account of when they're trying to work out how to introduce policies that make public transport delivery more responsive to these um, more inconsequential trips that could considerably add in collection in, in adding up to overall demand. So that's where I'm going to finish. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Thank you, Corinne. Very interesting um, presentation in relation how to measure culture. Um, um, it's very, I never heard of that uh, kind of uh, exercise. But um, I suppose I am surprised that um, you think that um, people which are more um, tolerant to diversity tend to be less happy of having dogs in the, in the public transport. Is that some of the conclusion? Less tolerant. Yeah, because uh, you said that um, uh, one of the uh, one of the in indices that you use was to do with uh, you know uh, acceptance of uh, uh, of uh, different views or acceptance of different uh, ways of behaving. I suppose uh, in your presentation, and uh, and this seemed to be surprisingly not correlated with allowing. Uh, people to use, um, uh, to have dogs in the public transport. Can I go back to the slides and show you? Yeah. So these, 
Never works when you try hard, does it? Yeah. Um, indulgence. Indulgence. Yeah. So um, the association was that people that had lower indulgence were more likely to support dogs on public transport. Lower indulgence is very surprising, isn't it? Um, I don't think it is. Um, no. High indulgence would be wanting to control what other people want. Ah, yeah. Ah, it's the opposite. Yeah. Whereas indulgence here, low indulgence, is not wanting necessarily to interfere with what other people want. I see. Okay. All right. And and that's mean that in connection with dogs, how it correlates that? Um, how did it correlate? Yeah, the, um, the level of indulgence was... I hope it was positive, it's a table. it wasn't, yeah. it was negative. I see, yeah. So, in this case... Then the, the what we're saying is that lower yeah. indulgence yeah. is associated with um, willingness to welcome dogs on public transport. Yeah, I thought indulgence means, well, it's, it's a question of definition. Indulgence um, is higher indulgence is that you, you allow more people to have their own views. But no, the, I think, well, I, the, way that, the way that yeah. Hofstede it defines it yeah. is that higher in, indulgence means you want to control other people. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Yes, I, I misunderstood the definition of indulgence. Okay, thank you very much. That's That's it. It. But um, in relation to the other issues that you talk about, you know, messy the trips, um, it's very hard, you know, for a, a housewife or a house uh, or husband, whatever, you know, to take uh, uh, children in public transport at the same time that you need to go and bulk, um, you know, buying bulk product for weekly shopping. So it's, um, they are very, very hard ways how you can make it more attractive public transport for these messy journeys, as you say. The for, I think it's, um, it's very, very hard to make uh, public transport uh, flexible enough for for allowing all these type of journeys from very different uh, origins to very different destinations. So no wonder if the car is such a predominant um, uh, uh, mode of transport in many, many cities. So it's very hard. Yes, but I think I would argue that it is hard, but the more that cities concentrate simply on the journey to work, the more the more these type of messy trips get ignored. And there are, I mean, people trip chain, that's very difficult to do on public transport. Um, you've mentioned bulky, bulky purchases, but you know, as we move on into the future, there are all sorts of different forms of public transport, like flexible transport, which does door to door trips. Those things could be brought into public transport policy and start catering for these trips, which are more difficult to um, ex um, cater for in a simple line, conventional type transport. Yeah, good. And I think if you don't think about them, then you perpetuate car use. And in perpetuating car use, it becomes much more difficult to be sustainable. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you, you have a, a question, Corinne, um, from Runa Kapu, yeah, in the chat. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. Yeah. It is, Shall uh, I read it out for you? Yeah. Yes, please. Or, or maybe okay. Yeah. Ing. Yeah. And um, uh, Runa said a great presentation, Corinne. I wonder if you could uh, uh, speak about uh, extrapolating these findings to uh, bringing bikes on public transit. Uh, for example, trains, especially in the bike-oriented cultures like Dutch um, cities, uh, perhaps looking at the transit policies for different abled people as another dimension might be interesting. Um, for, 
but differently abled, probably disabled people. Right? Yeah. I think um, my so comment on that would be people. that if you're looking at messy trips, then you have to yeah. look at the public transport system that you're working with. And certainly if you were looking at the Netherlands, you would be crazy not to consider active transport as part of the yeah. overall origin to destination trips. So yes, I think that will work. It's more likely to work in the Netherlands than it would in Sydney, but that doesn't mean it isn't part of the game plan to consider. Um, and Ronak is right that actually um, looking at um, people that are disabled, not only um, people that you recognize as disabled, but other people who have, for example, um, are visually, visually disabled and mm. find public transport difficult to, to traverse are another set of what might seem as inconsequentially small number of trips, but those trips which are important to the user and which if added up on aggregate could make a difference to overall demand. Good. Yeah. Anybody else want to make a question or comment about Karen? Or, or Runak, would you like to come back? Because uh, I thought the Dutch city is um, uh, kind of straightforward. It told the old bikers that uh, they should have two bikes, uh, one on each side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, Corinne. I, I think that was uh, a great response. Um, yeah, it got me thinking about when you said, like, these are the small 1% or 2% of all public transit trips, and most of the planners tend to dismiss them as inconsequential or messy, like you call them. Um, yeah, in the Netherlands, we might have some success with integrating active transport, but for the most part, like, I've seen a few buses which let you load uh, the bikes um, in front of the bus, but I haven't seen a lot of acceptance uh, with trains. Like when you try to get a bike onto the train, especially during the morning peak hour, I, I think you'll get a lot of dirty stairs and angry stairs. And we still, as a culture, haven't really embraced that sort of behavior. Well, maybe that should be the next survey to look at active transport trips and see whether that as a policy is something that is also subject to national cultural norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be super interesting. Yeah, very good. Thank you. All right, I think uh, we should move on, I think, uh, to the next presentation by David Simmons and Valentina Naka. Um, are you there, uh, David? I'm here. Yeah, all right. I'm so Valentina. Valentina, where is she? Muted, I think. Uh, where is she? <laughs> I cannot see her. <clears throat> Second row of my screen, but I think we all see different things. Uh, I cannot see her. Uh, I can, but uh, I still can't hear you, Valentina. I've unmuted myself. Ah, there, there, there you are. Thank you. So I cannot hear very well. Are you? Can you increase your microphone power? Uh, Marcel, it's your speaker. Uh, no, no, <laughs> no. I, I, I can hear everybody except Valentina. All right, okay. All right. Are you sharing the screen, Valentina? Good. Yeah, it's coming. Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, the, the, the plan is um, that uh, if it's okay to start, um, I, I was going to cover the first uh, part of uh, our <coughs> presentation. Uh, Valentina will continue uh, with the parts of the work uh, that she was most heavily involved with. Uh, and uh, I will briefly conclude 
uh, on some of the things following on from that. Uh, so next slide, please, Valentina. Uh, going to talk very briefly about the models on which this work was based. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, the way we use those uh, in some very quick work, which was ultimately for the Trussell Trust uh, about the need for food banks, like food parcels to be distributed during the pandemic. Uh, then Valentina will talk about uh, the work for Scottish government um, that uh, we did uh, following on from the Trussell Trust work. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, some of the enhancements uh, that we're making to our modelling uh, for uh, issues that are increasing, are going to be expected to be important uh, in the post-COVID world uh, and some issues we've identified along the way. So uh, moving on um, to the, the diagram. Uh, this is a diagram that uh, many of you would have seen uh, before uh, in previous AUM uh, meetings and at other conferences. Um, describing uh, the overall structure uh, of the Delta package models uh, that we've been uh, developing over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Um, very briefly, there is a zonal level model, um, which is representing uh, the spatial markets in property and uh, in the households and employment, households and firms that occupy uh, those properties uh, and the labour markets, uh, different levels of detail in different applications, as you'll hear. Um, that interacts with uh, a transport model, which is usually uh, developed uh, by another firm or organisation that we're collaborating with. Uh, and then alongside uh, our zonal model, we have two um, sets of submodels that work at a higher level, which we've referred to as macro zones in UK practice, they tend to be travel to work areas. One of those deals with the spatial economy, um, and in particular, it deals both with investment uh, and with trade and production, uh, uses an input output model to model um, the, the trade and production. Uh, that in itself has similarities to a lot of other models, uh, including uh, past Martin Center models and um, Marcel Ishnik's own uh, meal plan package, uh, but with the important difference uh, differences, one that there is a distinct investment model which deals with longer term location choices and the interaction with the zonal model. Uh, and there is also over on the right hand side of the diagram, uh, a model of longer distance migration. So model is representing uh, in longer term forecasting uh, that there are rather different factors that work at the higher level, uh, which is essentially between cities or towns, uh, rather than the zonal level, uh, which is within them. Uh, that's uh, all I'm going to say about the model at the moment. I think those are the critical points uh, in relation to what we're covering here. So uh, moving on uh, to the work for the Trussell Trust. Um, Trussell Trust is uh, Britain's largest operator of food banks, uh, i.e. it is uh, delivering packages of uh, food, groceries uh, to families uh, who are recognised uh, through various channels uh, as being otherwise unable to support themselves. Um, this is uh, a main, an important source uh, of support for uh, a disturbingly large number of households um, even before the pandemic uh, and the trust, which is a, a major a significant research and campaigning organization, uh, as well as an operator, uh, was uh, very concerned uh, about the potential for increase in the number of uh, destitute households uh, needing their support. Uh, it was quite a complex project uh, organized by Heriot Watt University, in, in particular by Professor Glenn Bramley. Um, which dealt first with, at a very early stage, uh, in what was then only just being recognised, the pandemic, uh, what the impact on the economy, uh, on firms and on workers' earnings or employment status would be. Um, 
and then fed that into a micro simulation analysis based on previous work uh, done at Heriot Watt and elsewhere, uh, which followed through the consequences, uh, particularly in terms of uh, what proportion of those who would lose their jobs or their incomes would be uh, already uh, impoverished uh, and would risk uh, destitution uh, as a result of the economic problems uh, in parallel, of course, uh, to uh, the problems uh, that would be caused by family members uh, actually becoming ill. Uh, so our part of the work was very specifically uh, one box out of nine here, uh, looking at reduced economic activity um, and feeding that in to all of the other processes. So moving on uh, to the next slide, please, Valentina. Uh, what we're seeking to do uh, and back in April or so uh, was to introduce a shock about the expected direct impacts uh, on each sector in the economy, assuming at that, uh, at that point uh, that they were spatially uniform. Um, uh, ideally, uh, we would have done that by specifying that a certain proportion of each industry would stop operating and not supply anything, uh, and that a certain proportion of labour uh, would not be available. However, uh, input-output models um, are not generally very good at dealing with supply constraints, or in our case, uh, they do deal with them with only gradually over a number of years through prices, which isn't appropriate here, where we're talking about something that would happen uh, almost overnight. Uh, so what we had to do uh, was to represent the direct effects by adjusting demand. So we basically scaled down uh, household final expenditure and other final expenditure, uh, particularly um, exports and in investment, uh, and adjusted intermediate demand so as to uh, knock out directly uh, those parts of the economy were, which were expected uh, to be directly affected. Uh, so that's the next slide, uh, or next slide, no, next slide, please, Fantina. Uh, we were doing this just in 2020, and uh, <coughs> the hope was that uh, this would only affect 2020 at the time. Uh, we were starting from an existing model run uh, for Great Britain, which had projected what we expected to happen uh, in 2020, uh, and we proceeded to run just two components, uh, the input-output model I've mentioned uh, with the shocks uh, to demands I've described, uh, and uh, the part of the model that uh, deals not only with the labour market, uh, which adjusts uh, the supply of workers um, and a number of people in work by household type and zone uh, in line with reductions in the demand for employment. Uh, and that produced um, <coughs> the results that we'll see in a minute. What we took as the initial shock, and bearing in mind that this was being done in the second quarter of the year when there was um, very little data apart from rapidly rising in, uh, unemployment figures, uh, were estimates that have been made uh, by OECD uh, about the impact of shutdowns. So this was looking at the parts of industry uh, that were expected to shut down uh, as part of the measures uh, to reduce the, the spread uh, of COVID-19 uh, on the grounds uh, that they were essentially unsafe uh, to operate. Uh, so we uh, had resort to measuring these uh, off the graph that's on the screen. Uh, we fed those in uh, to the sectors in the model as the direct effects uh, and the model uh, then calculated the uh, indirect effects uh, which arose uh, in other sectors. So uh, those essentially are the inputs that are on screen now on the next slide um, have uh, the outputs. So the blue lines are our translation of those uh, OECD figures um, and the uh, orange lines are the indirect impacts, essentially uh, negative multiplier effects. So see, for example, that uh, food and accommodation uh, was very directly affected 
there was very little left to be negatively affected by people uh, spending less or firms not running business lunches. Uh, in contrast, the primary sector, uh, agriculture, mining and so on, was um, unaffected directly, uh, but expected to take a 20% hit um, as a result of decreased demand um, and effects such as we saw, for example, in the oil industry, uh, that people would be uh, happy to stockpile materials, but literally ran out of space to do so. Um, we also had these results by uh, socioeconomic level on the next slide, showing things that have been widely reported since that uh, the uh, impacts were greater on lower level occupations, um, particularly on skilled manual. But that, that it, um, was it is separate from the fact that, uh, that is before we think about working at home, which is in Valentina's part of the presentation. Um, and so th these were the, uh, particularly the right hand side of that diagram uh, that summarizes important impact, 30% uh, or uh, sorry, nearly 50% uh, of um, low skilled workers uh, at risk of losing their jobs and those being the people who are you know, of the working population uh, most likely uh, to be impoverished uh, and at risk, um, especially of uh, destitution, especially in the case of failures uh, in the benefit system, which were you know, notorious. Um, I'll just briefly mention one comparison that we were able to do a little later, which was once ONS uh, had got into estimating the impacts. Um, the next slide shows uh, in the red bars uh, are impacts by slightly different aggregation of sectors um, in between two different estimates based on ONS data as to what was going on. And uh, uh, moderately, well, quite pleased under the circumstances uh, that there was a resemblance here uh, and that in most cases, uh, the bars of our estimates uh, are within the range that we took uh, from the ONS data. Um, so that, uh, there's a lot more that could be said just about that, but I've, I've used far too much time already. Uh, Valentina, I'll pass on to you. Thank you, David. Can everyone hear me? Hello? I can hear you, Valentina. Okay, perfect, good. <laughs> okay, so um, this part of the presentation will cover the um, work we've done for transport for Scotland. So based on what David has just um, described, that based on the work we've done for Trussell Trust, which was at the national level, we have then um, started to bring this study or to the next level, um, having a look at the, the impacts at, uh, in Scotland and introducing uh, also new calculations for the working um, at home people. Um, so this work, as David was mentioning, has been done during spring 2020. So bear in mind that lots of data was not available at the time. And the model, um, Talmus 18, the land use model um, that has been developed in, over the past 15 years, um, has been used to estimate the full lockdown situation and also to test different level of um, relaxation for the restrictions. So at that point, um, in, Scot in Scotland, we were in full lockdown and there were different, um, there was a roadmap with different phases, uh, but nothing was, um, but the evaluation went step by step. And so we were having a look at the impacts of various phases, um, reopenings. So um, with this part of the project, we have improved the method David has described before, and we have introduced the uh, treatment of working at home. So um, from the trust of trust work, we have got just number of people that are not working. 
um, while in this new project we have divided the people that are working from people that are working at home and people that are working in their usual workplace. Um, so the adjustment of number of workers um, to include, sorry, to exclude the people working at home has been done using um, relative probabilities of working at home by industry and then separate also by occupation from the um, Office National Statistics in 2000, a survey uh, carried out in 2019. And then we also got um, inputs by sector from um, the business impact covenant in survey. We have implemented an ad hoc procedure to take the number of workers by industry and local authority that we had that had been estimated in the uh, national, so at Great Britain level, um, as working at the usual workplace and apply them to control the Talmus 18 model. Um, some further adjustment by industry because the definition of industry were different uh, have been done along the way. So just a brief, brief introduction on Talmos. Uh, Talmos is a, a long-standing project that we have been developing from 2003. Um, so it's a transport economic land use model of Scotland. Um, on the right hand side, you've got a map of the zones and the macro zones that um, the model um, has been developed for. So it's 803 zones and there are, it's a quite detailed in terms of households and activities. Um, so the first stage of the work included applying the results from the national model uh, developed during the Trust of Trust study to um, Scotland level. And then the second stage um, is what uh, is shown in the um, graph on the right hand side of the slide, where we have got a, a business as usual case in 2020 from previous rounds of the model. And we input um, estimate of direct impact um, into the model. Obviously, these direct inputs are at sector level. They, there is no special spatial element here. And then the model runs the production and trade model and outputs um, the number of people that are not working uh, by socioeconomic level, by sector, and by work zone. Um, when we have got the number of people that are not working, then the we do a further run of, of one component of the model, so the employment commuting model, where we input the proportion of um, people that are working from home and the it's always by activity, by sector. And the model will output the total number of person, of people that are working at home by sector, socioeconomic level, and work zone and home zone. Um, so we have introduced this further distinction for people working at home. And um, the reason for that is because the focus this time uh, for tra from Transport for Scotland is, was that we were focusing on the people um, working at the usual workplace, which were the people which were the people who were in fact doing the trips to work and using public transport. So the results I'm going to show in the next two slides uh, are have got the same format as what as the the, the diagram step that's shown you for trust of trust, but they are. Um, they refer to Scotland. So the graph on the left hand side is um, shows the proportion, the percentage of business as usual workers that are not going to work. And here you can see the split between the direct effect, so the direct closure of the sector, indirect effect, so um, people that are not going to work because other clients or customers are closed. And then there is the working at home part. Um, where, where people are allowed or can work from home. Um, all of these inputs were taken from the SNM model. So, because at the time there was no 
Scottish data available to um, apply this study to Scotland. And then the next slide has got a graph that I've you that they've shown already. Um, that's with the total, uh, the, sorry, the percentage of workers not going to work by socioeconomic level. Um, and again, there is similarity with the trust of trust results. Um, as you can see, SEL3 has got the highest proportion of people not working, and SEL1, as one would expect, has got the highest proportion of people working um, from home. Um, that's another, this slide shows another uh, representation of the results we have seen so far. So, so far there was, it was an ag at an aggregate level. Now we can um, see how the distribution by a local authority on the left hand side and uh, zones on the right hand side um, is within the model. So the two maps here, they show the proportion of businesses as usual workers that uh, don't go to work either because they're working at home or because they have been furloughed or lost their jobs. Um, and um, as you can see, uh, Edinburgh Local Authority is the one with the highest proportion of workers not going to their usual um, workplace. Um, and there is also the detail on those on the right hand side. Uh, this is the work we've done for the lockdown evaluation. And then we have set up all, uh, quite a few different tests to estimate the demand for transport. So the people that are working at their usual uh, business place, uh, at their usual workplace in the different phases. So we set up different tests for phase two and for phase three. And something I wanted to um, bring up here is like the definition of worst case that we have got both for phase two and for phase three. So worst case is um, the worst case from a transport point of view. So when the public transport is going to have the highest demand and the different tests um, have been based um, have been run accord, uh, set up according to uh, different assumptions for reopening some of the key sectors, uh, assumption for education, retailing, and also, especially in the last phase, phase three, um, we wanted to have a look at, what, at the different scenarios um, according to the level of working at home. And this... Um, graph is slightly is, is, is different from what we've seen so far just because I wanted the, the point again here is to have a look at what is the um, highest demand in, in public transport. So um, those um, each of these tests is represented by a column that is 100 percent and the um, the gray the dark gray um, part of the of the column represents the direct effect so the uh, um, the fact that the uh, industry has been completely shut down light gray is the indirect effect so oh, as we see people that can't work because there is no client demand and then the green part is uh, represents the people working at home and the orange part represents the people that are going to work at the usual a workplace. So as that's the red pattern, what was mainly of interest of transport for Scotland, um, because obviously they wanted to have a look at where the most of the uh, passengers were due to travel on public transport, due to the um, restrict the two meters apart restriction that were um, at that time. Um, so this is just to show what sort of insight the model can give and uh, how it can um, help the, the institution to uh, take decisions about what, uh, how to implement policies. Um, David, I think this was my last slide. We can't hear you, David, if you're talking. 
sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Valentina. Uh, and just very briefly to conclude by describing some of the subsequent developments and issues that have emerged. Um, the first of these is that clearly uh, working at home uh, has become uh, much more of an issue uh, than um, before. But, uh, we've in effect had a, a massive uh, enforced experiment uh, in many of us in, in working at home uh, over the past uh, 10 months, um, which uh, for many people and many firms uh, has found it to be more practical, more productive uh, than had previously been anticipated. Uh, though many other people have found it uh, just as difficult as they expected or uh, found it simply uh, depressing, uh, mentally difficult uh, to cope with. Uh, but there is no doubt that it's now both on the uh, policy agenda uh, and on a sort of commercial agenda, both in the labour market uh, and in the property market, uh, where many tenants are thinking, well, do we need space uh, for so many desks? Uh, can we manage uh, with less space and have our staff working at home? Uh, so as part of our current work for Transport Scotland, uh, getting back into the intended planning uses of the Telmos model, uh, we're looking at improvements that will uh, make it easier um, to adjust the proportion of people working at home by sector, by occupational level, uh, and optionally by zone or area, uh, as the controls on a number of people uh, working at home, uh, and that's a number that will be uh, explicitly represented uh, in the data that passes to the transport analysis uh, as a matter of routine uh, in, in future. Um, but alongside that, uh, in looking at a situation where people may be choosing, we hope will be choosing uh, to work from home, uh, to include a variable propensity to do so based uh, in particular on household type, uh, and also on the length of commute. Um, bearing in mind that we would expect these propensities to vary markedly uh, if working at home is a worker choice. So, for example, we would expect, and there's some uh, prior evidence that suggests that uh, people, particularly say in older couples, are empty nests where children have grown up and left. Uh, there are spare bedrooms uh, which do very nicely as studies. Um, you can uh, see one behind me, um, that those people may be uh, most willing, most in, even enthusiastic uh, about working at home, uh, and that people who are living maybe in uh, shared flats where working at home uh, means, in, in the worst case, of you know, sitting on the bed all day, uh, will be extremely reluctant. Uh, so there may be very marked differences in people's willingness to work at home, given the choice of the matter, but there are also suggestions employers, major employers especially, are going to impose high levels of working at home, eventually as a, a contractual requirement, uh, that they will massively reduce their office floor space. Uh, and so this may become much more of a, uh, a common uh, across the board uh, pattern rather than being a worker choice. Um, so th that is what we are getting into uh, modeling. Um, with clearly you know, not very much data to go on at the moment. So this is for exploring scenarios uh, rather than making firm predictions. Uh, and uh, it will be get going in essentially to the interface program between our land use modeling and our colleagues' transport modeling uh, and will be used in different ways, uh, take account both of the effects on commuting uh, and the effects on other trips. One of the things that makes uh, working at home seem rather attractive from a some sustainability point of view uh, is that people working at home certainly <coughs> in the way that we do um, are sort of tied to a computer uh, and they actually make uh, fewer trips during the day not only than their commuting equivalents uh, but fewer than other people uh, who are at home during the day. Uh, so that's one major enhancement uh, and there's a range of other issues on the next slide, uh, which we will also be looking at, have started looking at for some of our clients um, about the implications um, of, for example, uh, households who don't already have a spare room or, or home office already demanding more space, 
uh, that they may put less weight on access to work in their location choices. Uh, similarly, that firms may require less space uh, and may put less weight on access to labor uh, and to other firms uh, in location issues. Okay, uh, so th those are things that we're looking at using the model by adjusting coefficients. Again, as there's a scenario exploration tool. Uh, and then uh, the final uh, issues um, that we've been picking up in thinking about uh, how we uh, populate all of this, um, finding uh, existing data, particular, for example, the English and Scottish censuses, uh, including the English one to be done this year, the Scottish one next year, uh, which, where the questions already committed, uh, don't make enough distinctions between people who are working at home but could commute to an employer's workplace. Um, those whose only workplace is their home, so sort of self-employed uh, freelance workers um, or those who are employed by a firm uh, on a wholly remote working basis, you know, like, like some of our staff who live uh, a long way from uh, our offices and work entirely at home. Uh, and then the people who uh, category of people who work from home but not at home, such as, for example, an independent taxi driver uh, who keeps her taxi uh, outside the house, but obviously you know, works outside. Uh, so those are issues which we hope uh, official surveys, as well as ad hoc ones, will be addressing in future. Um, and there's clearly a need for future research uh, as uh, we get back to a more normal situation, but a different one uh, to investigate how much future working at home is chosen by workers, how much is chosen by firms, uh, to look at the potential sorting effects, um, you know, where the workers select employers uh, on the basis of their working at home policies or requirements, and indeed people choosing where to live further from work on the basis uh, that they don't expect to commute very often or at all. Uh, changes in, in agglomeration effects. Uh, and so the one which I actually forgot to write down on this slide, uh, which is uh, how this turns out uh, in the labor market, uh, if firms are basically trying to put the costs of working space, trying to save renting that space in the office market uh, and to make employees find their own space, uh, how is that going to play out uh, in terms of salaries, especially if, for example, uh, households are then looking for bigger space because they have to work at home. So th this is really sort of casting a shopping list out uh, in the hope that we'll see uh, findings about this at future AUMs uh, and other meetings. Uh, and just one point I'd like to add in conclusion, uh, which is that uh, the model applications that Valentina and I have described depended entirely on making best use of existing models. So there was absolutely no time uh, to develop new models. We had to devise ways of making best use of existing models, uh, as indeed did our uh, colleagues uh, on the transport side who were uh, picking up those results. Uh, it has, I think, illustrated the value of having uh, more general models that are perhaps rather wider uh, in scope than required for routine planning. For example, simply the fact of having a model that works in one year steps. So we had a 2020 forecast as part of a sequence that went already to 2042. Um, and uh, more generally, again, uh, there's the old arguments often trotted out in discussions about modeling of uh, horses for courses uh, that you need different models for different purposes. Um, that uh, both in the original uh, analogy about uh, horses uh, and in the modeling case uh, means you need to have the right animal uh, in the stable first. So there is value to authorities uh, when a new problem arises, especially in the emergency of having a range of models available uh, to address uh, the issues that may arise. Thank you very much. I hope that was interesting. My thanks both to Valentina and to all our colleagues uh, in, at DSC and elsewhere who've uh, done all of the work that's uh, been described. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, really interesting application of existing models, as you said, and some of the 
issues that you may be confronted in the future. Um, I have a few questions uh, or comments in general, and then a couple of particular issues which I picked up in your presentation. In the first uh, instance in relation to uh, home working, there is um, some evidence from the US by Patricia Mokhtarian on the impact of uh, teleworking. Um, and what she shows that is not that people, um, all of them sort of uh, who takes uh, teleworking, uh, um, they not only work from home, but they mixed, um, you know, the journeys um, and stay, you know, maybe two, two days per week at home and then the other two days or three days going to work. So it's a mixture of the telecommuting and physical commuting on most of the workers, which uh, it has interesting implications in terms of frequency of travel, length of travel, as well as use of space, that you quite, uh, quite rightly identify that it has enormous implications of this in space, both at the home end, more space for working, and at the work end, less space uh, maybe hot desking. So the question is not just uh, yes or no, but a kind of mixture of um, uh, teleworking and physical working. Then another comment in general, I think, is the question of treating, how you treat this teleworking. I, I am of the opinion um, that we should be incorporated that as an alternative model split which uh, instead of going physically, you can go sort of electronically um, and you can treat it as, as one possibility with zero cost and, instant, and zero time, which uh, but is not suitable for every single um, uh, type of jobs. You know, sort of manual work as you probably the probability of using telework is low, while other office workers that may be possible to do. And I, we had an experience in when we did Cambridge Futures about 10 years ago, we looked at that and we simulated through a model split. As at that time, we didn't have a lot of information, but it was very interesting that you can make a, a, a mode of transport, the teleworking, or teleshopping. So that's something which I would like uh, you to comment on. In relation to particular uh, results that you show, I would like to ask a few questions. As I understand, you are using OECD as input for changing the amount of uh, employment. I suppose that the OECD include both direct, so the final demand effect, as well as indirect, or intermediate uh, production. Uh, so are you, how you separate these two? I suppose um, if you input one, it shouldn't be included in the other one. The other thing which surprises me, which is an interesting question, is the amount of impact that you are showing. You know, it's very high, you know, over 40%, uh, probably on average, the impact in unemployment well, we know that it hasn't been all that much, you know, in the last year has an increase of 2% of unemployment and probably will go much higher when, when furlough is finished, but never beyond 10%, I think. But you, you have shown a very, very high percentage of uh, reduction of employment. So it's one sort of particular question. And the other thing is, um, there is a lot of uh, information now of how many people are working in uh, doing teleworking for by sector. And on average, it's less than 50% um, during the lockdown. So is, uh, can you comment on that? Or maybe um, Valentina can comment as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. If I start, Fantina, uh, and perhaps if I can take the detailed questions first and work back to the more general points. 
Um, I mean, we should perhaps have uh, emphasized that what we're describing uh, is work which we did in uh, April, May uh, of last year, and then in, I think, May to July uh, for Transport Scotland. Um, and you know, uh, it, so we, we are describing uh, what we did then uh, based on the data or lack of it uh, at the time. Uh, the OECD uh, impacts, um, certainly from the original document, uh, we understood that those uh, were the uh, direct impacts of uh, complete or partial shutdowns, uh, basically uh, looking at the importance of different sectors, um, which they thought would be affected to different degrees uh, in the uh, different economies uh, that they were looking at. Uh, so I don't think there was double counting uh, there. Um, uh, and th that question was certainly looked at by some of the other uh, economists in other parts of the uh, sort of um, uh, consortium that was working on the Trustful Trust work. So and I believe we got it right on the basis of what uh, OECD was saying at the time. Uh, the, again, the, the, the levels of employment reduction, I mean, we were assuming that the effects would work through in full. Um, at the time, it seems that uh, we were getting effects in the right direction, but we were looking at the, essentially at the amount of work uh, not being done. Um, and we were doing this just at the time uh, when the furlough scheme uh, was being announced. So the, the original work was done at that time. So when we started, I don't think we actually knew uh, that there was going to be a furlough scheme uh, of the time type uh, that the UK government uh, fairly promptly introduced. Um, and so uh, also the effects of uh, being either out of work altogether uh, or on furlough, which you'll recall initially meant for most people uh, a reduction, 20% a 20, a 20 reduction uh, in income. Um, that was being worked out uh, in the later stages. So right, certainly if you take our figures as unemployment, uh, they are too high uh, compared, they, they were really the amount of work, well, they, pe people who are not doing the work, whether they were actually unemployed or on furlough. Uh, and yes, I mean, the data by sector on levels of telecommuting, um, which not, is it, perhaps not as quite as high as one would have expected in some sectors, uh, we're certainly drawing uh, on uh, what has been obtained uh, during uh, the pandemic, um, as well as the uh, data which uh, ONS were actually working on um, last year, so 2019, the year before, uh, and which they very hastily completed and published uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, which, you know, whilst it's not ideal, uh, is uh, a, a lot better than nothing. Um, picking up on the your more general points, if I go straight on to those, um, the point about uh, m people mixing um, workers working from home, uh, going to the office maybe two days a week uh, rather than five. Uh, yes, I mean we haven't said much about that, uh, but that is what it is effectively the, the average day uh, that we are aiming to represent in the new work for Transport Scotland. Uh, it does raise some very interesting questions in particular, again, uh, what happens if uh, this is controlled by the employer or chosen by the employee? Uh, if it's chosen by the employer, uh, one might expect that in many firms, uh, the focus will be on reducing the space requirement at the office uh, and that therefore uh, there would need to be a high level uh, of working at home uh, every day of the week. Uh, and that may, um, so one of our transport, public transport clients was very interested in this because they saw this as actually helping to reduce the problems uh, that they see in meeting um, peak demand. Uh, but we did point out that 
know, if this becomes something that is more of an option that's offered to employees um, to work at home on, on the days that they prefer, uh, what they might see is, I know this has been seen before, uh, less commuting on Mondays and Fridays, um, conventional levels of commuting in the middle of the week. Uh, and in the worst case, if everybody tries to go to work on Wednesday, uh, the, uh, the peak might even get a bit worse, at which point there was a sharp intake of breath from the other end. Uh, the point about telecommuting as a mode, uh, I, th I think that is an interesting idea. Um, and uh, it, it is certainly one that I would like to uh, come back to uh, as an alternative uh, to what we're doing in the Transport Scotland case. Uh, it's not really, it, it would be much more difficult uh, to introduce that in the current work, uh, which has scope to make limited changes uh, in a very short space of time. But uh, as a long term way of dealing both with uh, telecommuting and, as you said, with teleshopping, uh, I think uh, it's certainly worth further investigation. Um, th thank you for the reminder about that. Uh, Valentina, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add from the Transport Scotland end. Thank you, David. Uh, Valentina, do you want to say anything? No, David, I think that's everything. All right. Anybody else wants to ask a question to the David or somebody? Uh, or Valentina? Yes, Jamie. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, hi, David. Hi, Valentina. Thank you for hi, the very interesting presentation. I do have one question with respect to the um, uh, proportions of people working from home. In Valentina, you mentioned a, a survey from the ONS in 2019. Could you please specify which data was that about? If you have this information right now, otherwise I can. I don't have it right now. I'm sorry, but I, I will look into it and let you know. And um, no. with respect to the results you showed about the distribution according to socioeconomic status of uh, working or not working, you showed how are those who are more in the administrative section who uh, stayed more at home or didn't work, and also the less skilled. Would you also have some intuition with respect to the different sectors, uh, in particular the less skilled? Do you have an idea of how this distributes across sectors? I don't, David, I don't think we have looked that into detail for each of the sector, um, but I think that's definitely something we can look at. Because I guess there is, there is an interesting uh, possibly interaction between the concept of key workers and the level of specializations. Mm -hmm. And I have a sense that a lot of key workers in reality are less skilled, uh, but they still have to go to work. So there could be something interesting to verify there. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, there certainly is data about um, the different patterns. Um, so that is somewhere where I think the behavior of different sectors um, has changed uh, very rapidly uh, in response to the emergency over the past year. Um, one particular case I know of uh, is that the take up of um, uh, financial, uh, of telecommuting in the financial sector uh, had been quite slow because of security concerns. Um, and back in March, April, uh, the regulators in the UK uh, suddenly changed their tunes completely uh, and said that the financial sector must switch very large, almost entirely uh, to people working remotely, um, which uh, was very welcome. They, they slightly spoiled the impression uh, by saying that they were doing this to protect the banking system, not to protect the staff, which didn't go down quite so well. But uh, there are some respects where previous evidence on sectors has to be taken very carefully, but uh, I will find and circulate uh, the link. I've, I've got it on my desktop somewhere, but um, the, the, the link to the ONS 2019 work, uh, which was done before uh, the pandemic and published during it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Jamil, there is some information of the impact of the lockdown in uh, teleworking. Uh, by socioeconomic, no, by, by sector. It is available. 
and it is quite revealing. So uh, I think it's uh, ONS uh, information, but Ying Ying knows exactly where is the source. So he may be able to do it. Well, thank you very much. I think we ought to move to our final presenter, uh, David Metz, which uh, I hope there will be very controversial and very interesting presentation. So David, please go ahead. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts with you. Um, if I can share my screen. <clears throat> Now, can, can everyone see this? Not yet, but Not yet. hopefully now it's coming. Um, sorry, can you tell me what you can see? It's just a blank page at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening here. There it is, yeah. You see it? Yeah, good. Okay, I'm going to discuss a case study um, about the widening of the M25 motorway, which is the London Orbital Motorway. And the section we're concerned with is to the north of central London, um, between junctions 23 and 27. Junction 27 is where the M11 to Cambridge goes and junction 23 is the uh, A1M, the main road to the north. And the, this is part of a program of the Highway of Highways England, which is the executive agency of the Department for Transport. Uh, basically what they've been doing is to take the existing motorways, which are generally three lanes in each direction, plus a hard shoulder, and they've been converting the hard shoulder into a running lane, effectively increasing the capacity. And they've also added uh, variable message signs to uh, control speed at times of high use and manage any breakdowns. And they call the whole thing smart motorways, all lane running. So no hard shoulder anymore. Um, there's been some controversy about safety, um, but I'm not going to discuss that today. So um, in this particular case, uh, there was quite detailed monitoring of traffic volumes and, and speeds before um, the uh, new scheme opened and at, for three years afterwards, years one, years two, and year three. And um, this uh, slide shows the journey time on the vertical axis um, for both clockwise and anti-clockwise traffic comparing before the scheme opened with year three for a whole variety of time slots. So Monday to Thursday, the morning peak, the interpeak period, the afternoon peak, Friday the same, but the times are a bit different. And then at weekends, we've got all of traffic. And just looking at this, um, you'll see there's very little difference between the, the pairs uh, for example, here, the blue and the orange, this is before and year three. There's very little difference at all here uh, at year three. And there was no difference in transit times at year two. But at, <clears throat> at year one, um, the traffic did flow faster, 9% um, faster in one direction and 5% faster in the other direction. And the reason why this uh, tra speeding of, of traffic didn't persist was uh, substantial growth of traffic. So the conclusions of the year three monitoring were that there were 16% more traffic uh, compared with before the scheme opened, which was far higher than the local growth on the regional, regional motorway growth of about 7%. And the largest uh, growth of traffic was at weekends up to 23%, rather less on other days. And the, sorry, the conclusion of the year three monitoring, which was the, the, the final uh, monitoring report, was that these results show 
that the increase in capacity has been achieved, moving more goods, people and services, while maintaining journey times at pre-scheme levels and slightly improving reliability. Now that conclusion is, is misleading, as I will explain later. But what struck me immediately when I saw that was that this could not have been the justification for the investment because the justification for the investment, according to the standard uh, methodology for transport economic appraisal is based on the saving of travel time. There was no saving of travel time seen here be, be, before year one, uh, after, sorry, after year one. So I made a request to see the modeling reports and there were two models that had been used. There was the traffic model, which is a variable demand model based on the Saturn software suite, which is, uh, has been in use for 40 years now, uh, very well established. Uh, it covers the wider M25 region, well, well beyond the M25 itself taking into account all modes of travel. Um, the input demand is based on the Department of Transport's national transport model and the department's national trip end model, which takes account of population growth and changes in land use. And the traffic model was used to make forecasts for the opening year, 2015, uh, 2030, the um, uh, design year, so-called, in 2040, the uh, horizon year, um, and the models were run in full for these three years, and uh, for intermediate years there was interpolation. And what they were comparing was the, what is called the do-something case, in this case the investment in the widening, with the do-minimum, which was without that investment, but with everything else that was going on in the region. And then the outputs from the traffic model were used as inputs to the economic model, which is the Department of Transport's tuba model, the transport user benefit analysis, which is, does the cost benefit analysis. So we can then compare the um, observed traffic, which I've described earlier in year three, uh, compared with the before, we're looking here at the increased volume of traffic. We can compare the observed traffic with the forecast. And in the forecast, we're comparing the do something case with the investment compared with the do minimum case without the investment. And we're looking here at both clockwise and anti clockwise. So um, on the right hand side, far right hand set of bars, uh, the four bars are for each section of the road. Uh, between the different junctions, because the model is really a very detailed one. And you can see for the anti-clockwise direction, uh, the um, traffic volumes observed are always greater than the traffic volumes forecast. And for the clockwise direction, in two cases out of the four, for two sections of the road out of four, the outturn traffic volumes were greater than forecast. In one case, they were very similar, and in the final case, they were a bit lower. So overall, uh, the model was failing to forecast the volumes of traffic that were observed. Now, the model also uh, forecasts the speed of traffic. And for simplicity, I'll just show you one case. Uh, for junctions 23 to 24, for the morning peak clockwise, comparing the do minimum case without the investment the blue bar and the do something case with the investment, uh, the increased capacity, and that gives you a higher speed. We're looking here at the speed of traffic and we're looking at it for the three years that were modeled. And over the three years, the speeds declined because of the increased, uh, the background increase in traffic volumes, but there's always uh, an increase in speed as a result of the investment and hence of travel time savings which are then the inputs, or one of the important inputs to the uh, economic model. And this summarizes uh, from the economic model, the transport e economic efficiency benefits. Um, so for business users, the long distance users, we have time savings. This is a standard net present value uh, discounted over 60 years. Time savings of 475 million 
uh, offset by an increase in vehicle operating cost of 38 million because of the increased volume of traffic. Oops. For the um, commuters, consumers commuting, there were time savings, but these were offset entirely by increased vehicle operating costs. And similarly for other local trips by consumers, again, the time savings were very largely offset by vehicle operating costs. So the present value of the transport efficiency benefits derived very largely according to the model from time savings to business users. Now, what, what's happening here with the commuters, the short distance users, is that people are rerouting to use the faster travel made possible by the increased capacity of the motorway um, and not realizing that they're incurring increased fuel costs or maybe realizing but prefer the time savings. I mean, I can illustrate this with a, a hypothetical trip between Barnet, which is a suburb uh, in outer London within the M25 orbital motorway, uh, and a trip going northeast to the town of Ware in Hertfordshire. There are three uh, routes shown here. This is the usual uh, Google Maps uh, reflecting uh, actual traffic conditions. The shortest trip, the, the, the middle one of the three, 15.7 miles, is actually the slowest trip. The fastest trip is the one shown in blue, where you would go up to the M25 and the long uh, section that we've been discussing uh, to get to the A10, and then you would go north. And that's uh, a longer trip than the most direct route, but it's a shorter trip at 28 minutes compared with 34 minutes. And then there's another longer trip, but which is still faster than the most direct route. So this shows why it's very reasonable for a, a local user uh, diverting to take advantage of the motorway. Uh, and when the capacity was increased, that advantage was, would be uh, e even greater. It also illustrates a more general point that we really haven't paid much attention to, which is the, the advent of the sat-nav device, the digital navigation technology, which is changing travel behavior and is impacting on the investment case for, um, in, in, for increasing road capacity. So to summarize then the economic benefits, the economic efficiency benefits that I showed you in the, in the table uh, were 442 million discounted at present value. And that generated a benefit cost ratio of 2.9, which took into account uh, all the externalities as well as the capital cost. And any benefit cost ratio over two counts as high value for money according to the department's categorization. But as we see, the time savings whoops, failed to materialize because of additional traffic. Now from the traffic uh, monitoring, we don't know uh, what that traffic was, it's quite likely to be more diverted local trips of nil economic value, uh, which will be taking up capacity that might have been used by business users. There may be some, some new trips, um, particularly at weekends. You remember I mentioned the 23% in weekend traffic. That's presumably not commuting traffic, probably not business traffic, probably leisure trips, which some of which might be new. Um, because the capacity is taken up uh, by local trips, there's no benefit or little benefit to business users. And of course, there are more externalities related to vehicle miles traveled uh, than forecasts, more carbon emissions, more air pollutants, more noise, etc. So clearly the benefit cost ratio on the outturn is far less than the 2.9. Indeed, it may be negative because um, if all the extra traffic are local diverted trips of no economic value, and there is more traffic vehicle miles traveled with externalities, we could actually be worse off as a result of uh, this increased capacity. Is this a special case? And I think the answer is probably not. Um, the strategic road network in Britain comes under greatest stress in or near areas of high population density where there is a lot of local traffic that can take advantage of the strategic road network. Um, so I would expect the example here to be not untypical. 
the UK road investment strategy for the current five year period includes 17 uh, smart motorway investments, which are forecast to have an average benefit cost ratio of 2.4, a bit less than the M25 scheme, but almost certainly very much uh, in excess of outturn. So we have a problem uh, with traffic forecasting models, uh, at least with this particular traffic forecasting model that was used. And I think we're suffering from optimism bias here. Um, this is a well-known problem, uh, particularly as regards uh, capital cost of schemes, where at the early stages, it's quite common for an optimistic view to be taken uh, with the outcome that capital costs could be much higher than forecast. We, we've also seen optimism bias in demand forecasting, particularly in competitive situations. For example, uh, the rail franchise awards in Britain where the winning bid in the competitive situation has often been optimistic in terms of forecasting future demand and the franchises have failed. And similarly in Australia, there've been many competitive bidding situations for toll road franchises where the winning bid um, proved very disappointing to investors. In the present case, the bias, I think, is not to forecast more traffic, it's to forecast less traffic in order to generate the time savings that the, the economic appraisal requires. So economic benefits uh, are therefore overstated and the externalities related to traffic volumes are underestimated. The impact of digital navigation is a sort of newish phenomenon, uh, but it's very widely used now, and we're disregarding that in our modeling. Um, and most important, there's a real lack of effort to, to validate models. There's a huge effort goes into building models and very little effort into validating models. And the Saturn modeling suite, which has been used in the present study, is you know venerable goes back 40 years uh, has been developed actively over the period endorsed by the department of transport as far as i know having made inquiries no prior effort to validate this that yet there, when one can take advantage of uh, the uh, detailed monitoring data as we have had in this case we find the model in this application at least was quite invalid so we need much better evaluation. We need to go beyond uh, traffic counts, which aren't very informative. We need to do longitudinal studies to see how individual travel behavior changes following an intervention. So in a longitudinal study, you follow the behavior of a, a representative group. Uh, in a case like this, uh, travel patterns before a scheme opens and then how these patterns change at intervals of time afterwards. Longitudinal studies are quite common in the areas of uh, healthcare, medicine, and social sciences, but they've been very little used in transport. Indeed, I'm not aware of any study, any longitudinal study of uh, any major intervention. Um, but it should now be feasible using the kind of travel diary techniques that have been used in the National Travel Survey probably updated to use GPS technology to locate people. Um, and mentioning the National Travel Survey brings me to my final point, which is that time savings are not in fact the long run benefit um, of transport investment, although that is the conventional assumption. So if we look at the National Travel Survey, where we have a 50 year time series almost now, uh, I'm showing here the three key parameters. The bottom trend line is the trip rate, about a thousand trips a year, averaged across the population, covering all modes of travel except international travel by air. The middle trend line is the average travel time, about 370 hours per person per year, um, pretty stable over the period, about an hour a day. Not just true of Britain, but true of pretty well all settled populations that have been looked at. What has changed over this period is the average distance traveled, shown at the top, which grew steadily in the last century, uh, but then stabilized and ceased to grow. The growth was due to increasing car ownership and increasing uh, road construction, which allowed people to travel faster in the same amount of time, but that process has come to an end. But over this whole period, 
we were investing huge amounts of money in new transport infrastructure justified by the saving of travel time. Yet we see in aggregate no travel time saving over the period. And the reason is that people don't take the benefits uh, of uh, faster travel uh, in the form of more time for work or leisure. They take the benefits in terms of access, access to more people, to more places, giving more opportunities and choices. And this is a point that has be, is being increasingly recognized. And I, I quote here from a report of the International Travel Forum, operational transport projects is traditionally focused on travel time saving and congestion relief. However, there is a growing understanding that this misses the ultimate purpose of the transport system, which is to provide access to employment, goods, services, and other opportunities. Now, access is quite different from time savings. It's subject to diminishing returns. The more access you have to a typical kind of destination, the less the value of, of an increment. Access increases broadly with the square of the speed of travel, because it's defined as proportional to the area of the circle, whose radius is proportional to the speed of travel. So this combination of sub being subject to diminishing returns but increasing with the square of the speed gives you a saturation function, which is in fact what we see with the National Travel Survey, that cessation of growth. And of course, increased access leads to changes in land use and land value, um, which we can observe. So my conclusions, uh, firstly, the case study, of the model of, of the M25 widening. The modeling uh, very much overstated the economic benefits. The model had not been validated. Um, and so uh, the failure to forecast was, is surprising. Uh, to validate our models, I think we need to track how travel behavior changes after an intervention um, using modern techniques. And finally, the use of unvalidated models that suffer from optimism bias results in investments that turn out to be poor value for money. Um, the M25 study I've written up and is due to be published in Transportation Research Part A. Um, I have a piece recently out in Transport Planning and Technology um, about time constraints and travel behavior the, based on the National Travel Survey diagram I have sh shown you. A book of mine a couple of years ago, I looked at the new uh, technologies that are influencing road use. And there's a chapter on digital navigation, though that's getting a little dated now. And um, much of this can be found on my website shown here. Uh, so I'd rather rush through that because I'm conscious we're uh, getting short of time, but thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, David, for your interesting uh, and challenging uh, presentation. I completely agree with you that we need to have more validations of the models that we use in order to understand how well and how good they are, and uh, how they represent, you know, reality in some ways. I would like, uh, if I may, to have three comments. I would like you to comment in three aspects, which I picked up from your presentation. The first one, as you said, you know, the models which are used, they are not picking up enough of the diversion of traffic maybe, and also the change of supplies for industry. Uh, the, you, you may find that some um, industrialists start buying from another supplier if you do have a better access to them via the increase in the in the capacity of the network and the same for new markets so which are appears for some uh, products uh, production uh, institution or firms uh, which may change the pattern of of land use. So maybe these models are not sufficiently in tune with all these changes and elasticities in relation to that. The second question, which I think I'm not sure if I understood correctly, because certainly the benefit cost ratio not only includes 
what happens in the M25 itself that you are measuring that it hasn't been a very much change in the speed of travel, but it could have affected the whole of the network and that benefits are included in the, in the benefit uh, cost ratio, not only the one that you are looking in detail. So how you take into account that, uh, I'm not sure, and so it will be interesting for you to uh, elucidate on that. And finally, in relation to traveling, um, you know, of uh, mobility in some way, you show that kind of ground mobility hasn't increased all that much in the last few years. But if you take prior to the pandemic, um, you know, the increase in, in, in air travel has been enormous. And if you add uh, the, the sort of air or land, land uh, uh, mobility as well as the air mobility, you will find that mobility has increased because people, they may have gone to the local beach for a weekend, but now they used to go to, you know, for Mallorca for spending the weekend or the traveling with the children in, in the half, uh, you know, in, in between terms of education. So if you include air travel, you will find that the mobility hasn't, yeah. hasn't reduced. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, in terms of the use of the network, uh, as you say, um, if um, digital navigation techniques uh, allow more efficient use of the network, this will allow markets to develop. Mm -hmm. um, but the dilemma is, does one want to push more traffic down minor roads? Uh, the Department of Transport has recently revised its road, tra road, tra road traffic statistics um, and has, has identified a 26% increase in traffic on minor roads over a 10 year period. Um, there are problems with the, the sampling technique, but it does seem to be due to uh, the increased use of sat nav devices. So on the one hand, it's more efficient. On the other hand, uh, you may be putting traffic in places where you don't want to have it. You might feel you would like to keep your minor roads for um, active travel um, rather than car based travel. Um, on the benefit cost ratio, um, my, these are of course not my models. I'm just an observer of the models and have read the detailed modeling report. So though the, um, the, the full workings of the model are not in the public domain, they're proprietary. But the, uh, the way the, um, the uh, economic model works is to take account of all the changes in traffic within the whole area, including all the M25 and well beyond it, and is comparing the do something case, the widening of this particular section with the do minimum case. So all the consequential changes uh, should be taken into account, including you know, effects uh, on the other side of the M25 at Heathrow and so forth. On the question of, of air travel, um, uh, I mean, this has been debated in the past and I have look carefully to see what impact um, in the increased volume of air travel might have on uh, the travel measured in the National Travel Survey, which is mainly daily travel. Now, to some extent, if people are abroad longer, they're not making local trips when they're abroad. Um, but when I've uh, looked at this in, in some detail, my conclusion was that the growth of air travel was not sufficient to explain uh, the flattening off uh, of um, uh, average distance travel per capita, which started around the late 1990s. It's quite, it was quite a marked break in trend in the average distance travel as seen in the National Travel Survey, whereas air traffic growth had been pretty steady over that period. So I think um, that's not the explanation. Thank you, David. Um, uh, I, I must uh, sort of repeat something which I, I think you didn't address. The question that you are saying that uh, the model failure in terms of because the speed are the same, uh, uh, even if the volumes are more, 
um, but it refers to a particular section of the motorway, but the benefit includes all of the areas you are, uh, you are saying, you know, not only in that section, but elsewhere. And it may have been the case that the benefits in the local smaller network is much higher uh, than in the, uh, because of in, in, uh, reductions of, uh, of volumes in the secondary network, which are included in the cost benefit analysis, but you are not referring to in relation to your section, particular section. But I, that's my, my, my comment. In any case, I would like to find anybody else who would like to comment or, or make questions to uh, ask questions to David. Anybody else? Because I don't see any chat uh, questions. No? Marcel, it would be great if we could actually read uh, David's paper, which is coming out. David, uh, is there a preprint that you could uh, share with us so we could put it on the website? Or uh, we could uh, we would be ready to, uh, well, uh, to, to, to wait, um, uh, be prepared to, to wait for um, it will um, come out uh, in um, the URA. I'll, uh, I gave the link to my website and I'll um, put up. Yeah. It's not yet finally agreed by the editor. Um, ah, okay. Uh, it's sort of gone through a number of, of rounds of review, as you might expect, uh, but we're nearly there. Fantastic. Uh, well, because uh, the other paper which uh, addresses similar issues uh, in the transport engineering technology, uh, so presumably that one is available now. Yeah, right? if you, if you'll find it on my website, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll do that. Or perhaps we should make that uh, more, ex more explicit so that um, people will then look out for it. So certainly, because these are highly interesting areas for us, um, so uh, we need to perhaps to look at it. Um, Perhaps uh, once um, uh, colleagues um, and and also my, uh, myself and our team perhaps we could come back to you once we have read the article. Well, uh, I would like to thank uh, David uh, Simmons, David Metz, and Corinne uh, for and Valentina for their really interesting presentation and thought provoking. I hope that everybody has enjoyed this uh, and will probably have more information um, um, available very soon on this kind of work. So thank you very much everybody for listening and for uh, sort of speaking in this uh, session. And I suppose that we we'll now should stop and, <laughs> and give um, um, way for the next presentation, which is in one minute's time. So in. Um, and yeah. Ming Fei may want to say a few words. Well, I just want to say thank you, myself, for chairing the session and uh, thank you for all the speakers. Uh, now, yeah, I have to close the session now. And this next one would be our second session for modeling methods. And uh, you're welcome to stay. And if not, the recorded video will be online very soon. So if you go to our AUM website, you should be able to find the link tomorrow or next week.